I'm going to tell you a story about my journey into the world of storytelling and give you a, a few of the tips I learned along the way. So let's go back to where the story starts. I grew up in a place called Wisha, which is a little town outside of Glasgow, about 15 miles southeast of Glasgow in the lowlands of Scotland. Now, it's not that romantic Scotland that you would have seen on calendars with lovely rolling hills and highland cattle grazing, uh, men wearing kilts and playing bagpipes and a few castles dotting the horizon. No, 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 no. This was the heart of industrial Scotland. It was a working class community full of coal mines, iron, and steel works. In fact, it was home to a place called Ravenscraig, which was the largest steel works in all of Europe when it opened in the late 50s. It covered 400 acres, and it had smokestacks that would spew out huge, dark, thick clouds of sooty ash that would settle on our town like a fine black snow. And I can still remember running out with my mum to collect the washing off the line that was hanging out to dry, because if you didn't get it in before that suit settled, you were washing it all again. But despite this smoggy atmosphere, this was a place full of magic. My favorite times were the evenings spent with family and friends sharing stories. Sometimes they'd talk about stories about your relatives. Sometimes it was like Scottish heroes and villains. Other times, those lovely Scottish dark, gory fairy tales. But it was through this experience that I developed an inner, fierce sense of pride about who I was and where I came from. Not the kind of pride that you get through power and money. But the best storyteller of all, by far, was a woman called my Granny Jemison. Now, she was about four feet and a half high in heels, but she was a wee firebrand of a woman that had the best stories. She could tell you stories that would scare you silly and make you laugh till you cried. Now, a lot of the times growing up and uh, going to visit Granny, we would be exposed to stories of all different kinds, but my favorite ones were the ones about her life. She was born in 1900, and she went to work full-time down the steelworks at the age of 14, and she was lucky to get that job, only because a lot of the men had been called up to serve in the First World War. The only uh, defense that she had from the intense heat and the sparks that would fly from the work she did was aprons made of burlap sacking and wet rags that she would wrap around her arms and her legs. Because her main job was to pull freshly forged steel ingots through big water troughs to cool them down. But she picked up a lot of colorful language and incredible stories <laughs> from her fellow workers, which she wove into fantastical tales of bravery and her world adventures. Now, Granny taught me a lot. And unfortunately, the magic for me disappeared when our family moved hundreds of miles south to go and live in England. You see, my dad had gotten a better paying job, and he thought he was taking us to a place that would be better to raise the family. And we moved into a middle class society that was definitely full of cleaner air, tennis courts, and grammar schools. But it was also a society that prided keeping themselves to themselves, and as a result, as a family, stories were not to be found anywhere. And so as I moved into my teenage years, I mistakenly believed that stories were just the stuff of childhood and better left behind. Years passed, and I left England and came and settled in Canada. And then in 1994, something happened that changed my life forever. My granny Jimison died. And I remember in the days and weeks that followed, I began to think about those magical years I spent in Scotland, and I began to realize that what she had given me as a gift was what Ken Robinson today would describe as a cultivated imagination. And I realized her death didn't have to be the end, it could be the beginning. And so it started my 10-year journey to find out what it meant to be a storyteller. And part of this took me back to Scotland, where I spent time with the elders of storytelling in communities where stories were still part of everyday life. And I also went to the University of Edinburgh, to the School of Scottish Studies, and I listened to recordings of stories told by storytellers long since dead. And I started telling stories whenever and wherever I could. I told at concerts and conferences and festivals and halls 
homes, in schools, and even on ships. And the one thing I realized that everybody is still hungry to hear stories, not just children, adults too. And that stories had so much power, more than I ever thought they ever would contain. But I was a typical Scot, so I was quite skeptical about this, and I had to learn more. And so I decided that I'd spent all of this time on the art side of storytelling. I now wanted to look at the science and to see if that supported this. And so that was about five years ago. And as they say, timing is everything, because that also coincided with amazing research breakthroughs in neuroscience. And I'll share a few of the highlights um, right now. But first, let's look at stories from an evolutionary perspective. Now, humans were given language or developed language skills about 50 to 70,000 years ago. So we've only moved from an oral culture to a print culture in what amounts to a blink on the evolutionary timeline. So it should come as no surprise that we are still hardwired to exist as an oral culture, which means we're also hardwired to remember facts couched in stories. And it was the elders that held the wisdom and passed it along. And it was up to them to be able to pass it along in a way that we would remember it. So evolution over probably thousands of years developed an incredible technology for packaging wisdom in a way it could be remembered. That technology is stories. It's even believed today that when we get to the point in our lives with, when in our bones we feel as though we're going to shuffle off that mortal coil. And what happens is there's a built-in reflex for us to pass along our wisdom because it was necessary for survival. I mean, we had to pass on things like where was the best hunting grounds, the recipes for medicine, which plants and animals you could eat and which ones you couldn't, how to build tools, and much, much more. So it's a shame that even in today's society, we don't necessarily listen to that wisdom because we don't necessarily listen to our elders that much anymore. And also, we tend to think that wisdom doesn't exist in a local. We believe that wisdom exists outside of ourselves and our families and our communities, and we have to bring experts in. And what a shame when you think of the best technolog technological uh, tools that we have to communicate is still what we arrive with built in. Our eyes, our ears, our voice, our mind, our language. Nothing is that sophisticated. So this should come as no surprise that there's a surge in interest now that science is supporting it to learn storytelling skills. Corporate executives, physicians, clinicians, administrators, even some enlightened governments are putting funding into the educational system to teach oral storytelling to children. So my granny died 17 years ago. And I'm still growing into her wisdom. And one of the things I want to do is share a couple of tips that if you are interested in diving into storytelling, here's a few things that might help you along the way. First of all, develop a fanatical curiosity. Start to really take an interest in other people outside of your homes, your communities, because you will only retain not just what you hear, but what you want to hear. So you have to cultivate that desire, which means shifting focus from yourself to others. The next thing is to embrace and engage in listening. I mean, listening helps you understand how others perceive the world. But more importantly, it helps you develop empathy and sympathy. And as we move more and more into a global community, surely this is a skill we want to learn ourselves and for our children to practice and perfect. And also, listening is a gift. It's one of the most precious gifts you can give to someone. There's those who believe we walk around with a big sign on our chest that says, I just want someone to listen. So practice giving that gift to people. And then obviously gather stories. Gather stories about your family, your grannies, your aunties, whoever can tell you those stories to pass on to your children. Because it may take time, but they will come to recognize the value and their inherent wisdom in those stories. And choose stories that you're passionate about. You can perfect telling stories from the head and the mouth, but so much better to get great, authentic content by telling stories that ignite your passion so you can tell them from the head and the mouth tied to your heart, because nothing's as important as those stories. Now, 
When I was back in Scotland, I spent time with lots of many storytellers. One of my favorite ones was the traveler storyteller called Duncan Williamson. Unfortunately, Duncan's gone. He died a few years ago. They said that he had about 3,000 stories that he could tell at the drop of a hat. He said, you're not really a storyteller unless you have at least 300. <laughs> But he told me that whenever you tell a story that you've carried in your heart, when you give it away, the person that you heard it from stands behind you, and the person they heard it from stands behind them all the way back to the beginning of time. So you may not have realized this, but all the time that I've been up here on the stage, right behind me is that wee fire brand of a woman called my Granny Jimison. And behind her is her granny, Granny Wells, going back to about 1850. So this is what I, my challenge to you is to think about what stories do you carry with you that you give away to people when you meet them? And how much better it would be that when we meet someone new that we can actually tell them who we are, not just what we do for a living as we pass along a business card. So think about the stories you carry and think about who is standing just behind you when you pass on those stories. Thank you for listening.